Welcome everyone, I am Adde Shewa Josh and this is Africa Matters. We begin in Ethiopia where China is offering a helping hand to mediate the crisis in the Horn of Africa. We we'll look at what has triggered the shift in Beijing's Africa policies. In South Africa, demand for foreign ingredients has shot up as expat restaurants see a surge in local customers. And finally, we look at the impact of climate change in Africa as deforestation rates spike across the continent. For the first time, China has offered to mediate regional disputes in the Horn of Africa. Beijing says it wants to take its involvement in the region beyond trade and investment and play a more active role in its peace and security. The Horn of Africa, which comprises Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Eritrea, Sudan, South Sudan, Djibouti and Uganda, together receive a larger share of China's loans to the continent. The region's geographical proximity to the Red Sea plays a huge role in Beijing's multi-billion dollar Belt and Road Initiative. On Monday, June the 20th, China's special envoy to the Horn of Africa, Shui Bing, convened the first regional peace conference in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. Representatives of all the Horn countries were present, except those of Eritrea, which excused its absence on technical grounds. Shui says that unlike the West, Beijing will not get involved in internal affairs, only participating in peace negotiations upon invitation. China will continue to support countries in the region to uphold the vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, protect, the region, protect regional peace and security, and silence the guns in the Horn of Africa. I myself am ready to provide a mediation efforts for the peaceful settlement of disputes based on the will of countries in this region. Analysts say China's proposed conflict mediation role deviates from its decades-long policy of non-intervention. The US, the EU and the African Union have all at times tried to mediate conflicts in the region with limited results. The ethiopia tigray conflict, coups in Sudan, a stored peace process in South Sudan and the worst drought in four decades are some of the crises currently threatening stability. Ethiopia's national security advisor, Redwan Hussein, says conflict in the Horn of Africa should be resolved locally in collaboration with international partners. I'm well aware of some of perceptions and suspicions being raised about the conference such that what makes it different from those held in the past. At the same goes, the proof of the, the budding, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and it is upon us to prove the conference result is in the concrete actions. In December last year, China announced it will scale back its financial commitments to Africa for the first time in more than a decade. Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged $40 billion in investment and credit lines, a 33% drop from the $60 billion it provided in 2018. And experts say Beijing's downward review of its investment in Africa and a shift in its policy of non-intervention reflects China's need to safeguard its interests in the region from conflict. At least 25% of Chinese investment in Africa goes to the Horn and is used primarily to finance infrastructure projects, including the Ethiopia Djibouti Railway and the Nairobi Mombasa Standard Gauge Railway. Djibouti is also home to China's only military base in Africa, alongside military outposts of several other countries, including the US, France, Italy, Japan, and Saudi Arabia. So what makes China think it can succeed where other superpowers have failed? Let's hear more from Hodan Abdi, former senior advisor to the president of Somalia on relations with China. She joins me from Garowe, Somalia. Thank you so much for making out time to speak to Africa Matters. Let's start with What's driving China's new interventionist approach in the Horn of Africa? Well, thank you so much, Ade, for hosting me at the show. Um, as we all know, China is a significant partner for the countries at the Horn of Africa. Uh, China has significant investments, both in infrastructure and also other uh, financial investments. It's host to some of its regional hubs for some of its biggest companies. At the same time, 
China has um, a, a significant diaspora population who live in countries in the Horn of Africa, in Djibouti, in Kenya, Ethiopia, and in Tanzania. But also, most importantly, Ch Ch uh, the Horn of Africa is host to China's only overseas military base, which makes China a um, very significant investor, and it gives us a huge stake in the peace and stability of the Horn of Africa. But why now, though? Well, I believe that this has been a long time in the making. It is not something that just came out out of nowhere. However, uh, I believe that the conflict in Ethiopia and its uh, repercussions and uh, um, effects on the overall environment of investments in the Horn of Africa has made a you know, significant um, impact on China's approach to the Horn of Africa. So you would say that, you know, this is not, as you said, something that came out of nowhere. It was premeditated all the while when the rest of the world was suspecting that China one day could make a U-turn in terms of its policy on Africa, uh, get involved beyond trade and investment. Um, is this what you mean by it didn't happen overnight? Well, absolutely. China's uh, foreign policy, uh, as we all know, especially people who study the field, uh, is always evolving. And it is always amending and it's always um, adding to itself and adjusting where necessary. And these decisions never happen overnight. It is, it is, it is the outcome of a long process of rigorous research, rigorous deliberation, and rigorous um, uh, preparation and effort. So I believe this has been a long time in the making. And it is the outcome of an ever-evolving China's foreign policy not just towards Africa, but its overall foreign policy. What leverage then would you say China has over other superpowers in mediating crisis in the region? And what challenge is Beijing likely to face? Well, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, if I would start with the challenges, the challenge, I believe the most important challenge that China would face in trying to mediate conflicts in the Horn of Africa is its lack of experience in the field, especially lack of experience working uh, in resolving conflict and mediating issues in the Horn of Africa, given the huge complexities that exist in the region uh, that are both historic mm -hmm. and at the same time that are both that are also contemporary. However, um, I wouldn't call it a leverage, but what gives China a special advantage in this kind of process is also the fact that it's a new player in the field, which, make, which makes its approach uh, new, and it could be, um, you know, it has an opportunity to learn from everything everybody else was doing in the region, uh, either Middle Eastern countries or Western countries that have tried to mediate in the region. It can learn lessons from these uh, efforts and approaches and expand on them or add to them using its own um, historic and cultural background. So if this approach, this peace resolution that China is proposing succeeds in the Horn of Africa. Do you see China replicating that approach across the continent? And at what point would it stop? What else would China want to do on the continent? Well, the African continent is an important development partner for China, just as it is an important development partner for the rest of the world. However, it holds a, a very special uh, place when it comes to China-Africa relations, because Africa is one of the last places on this planet, which is at a very early stage of its development, which gives China and also other countries an opportunity for investment and an opportunity for uh, growth. So this is, this is why Africa is very important for China. Now, if we're asking the question, what else would China be doing? Would it be replicating this across the continent? I definitely believe that this is a trial, and if it does succeed, then China would uh, take this approach not only across the continent, but also across the world as it discovers its new right. um, um, powers, yes. All right, thank you so much. Hoden Abdi, former senior advisor to the president of Somalia on relations with China. Thank you so much for speaking to Africa Matters. It was a busy week for other leaders across the continent, too. The UK's Prince Charles and his wife, Camilla, met with leaders of the Commonwealth of Nations in the Rwandan capital, Kigali. Ukrainian President Vlodomir Zelensky also held a virtual meeting with the African Union.
nearly 10 weeks after he first asked to address the body. Only four African leaders attended the meeting, while the rest sent representatives. Mr. Zelensky blamed Russia for soaring food prices and wheat shortages on the continent. He also called for UN reforms and a more prominent role for African countries in the Security Council. Your voice in the UN Security Council, the voice of Africa, has not been fully heard. But in today's globalized world, a world without Africa and Africa without ties with the world are impossible. And it is the right that the African Union conducts a principled activity, defending the interests of all the inhabitants of your continent. We have more stories coming up for you here on Africa Matters, including planting seeds of hope. Farmers in Mozambique use coffee plantations to battle climate change and recover lost forests. And I'll tell you how food ingredients from Nigeria and other African countries are opening up South Africans to trying new flavors. The coffin of slain Congolese Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba has returned to Kinshasa more than six decades after his assassination. Belgium also handed over a tooth believed to be the last of his remains to his relatives. Lumumba's coffin was flown from Brussels to Kinshasa for a nine-day trip around the Democratic Republic of the Congo. From there, accompanied by a delegation, they were taken to his hometown, the village of Analwa in the central province of Sankuru. Lumumba, the country's first post-independence leader, was born there in 1925. In 1961, he was murdered and his body dissolved in acid, with only the tooth surviving. After more than 60 years, the former colonial rulers of the DRC held a restitution ceremony in Brussels. Let's take a closer look. Patrice Lumumba was the first democratically elected prime minister of the Congo after the end of Belgian colonial rule in 1960. He not only championed national unity and economic freedom, but pan-African unity as well. Less than seven months after independence, Lumumba was assassinated and dissolved in acid by Katanga authorities, a breakaway Congolese state with the collaboration of Belgians. A Belgian police officer kept his tooth as a hunting trophy. Historians estimate that killings, famine and disease killed up to 10 million Congolese during the first 23 years of Belgium's colonial rule. Belgium has not apologized for the atrocities, but it says repatriating the remains of Lumumba is a small but symbolic step towards dealing with its brutal colonial past. It's moving. At the same time, it's about discovering my own. It also strengthens our determination in the fight that Patrice Lumumba led. And when we look at the situation of the village, there is a lot of work to do in a democratic framework, of course. Today is really a tribute to Lumumba because we have had 61 years after his death. We had not imagined it, but we finally saw his remain exposed in our village. That's why we thank God. Restaurants in South Africa that used to cater only to expert communities have been seeing more and more locals coming in. This growing appetite has also led to a greater demand for raw ingredients to bring new flavors into South African homes. In Sepeng Motema reports from Johannesburg. Bringing the taste of Nigeria to South Africa, Olalekan Ajikbotafe serves up dishes from his homeland at his restaurant in one of Johannesburg's upmarket neighborhoods. He says after fellow Nigerians, the second largest pool of patrons are black South Africans. A lot of people are getting more interested in Nigerian food and it's, it's big for us. We do have a lot of customers that come into the restaurants and they don't even go for the basic. They don't go for jollof rice, no. They want to go for a gusi or bono. They want to go for the proper, proper deep Nigerian food. But it hasn't always been this way. When Ajik Botafe moved to South Africa in 2012, the number of locals who were open to trying food from other African countries was still very low. This, this food we call plantain. It's a very nice food. It's like bananas. I've had somebody telling me never, I'll never eat fried bananas. And I'm telling them this is premium food in Nigeria. Generally, South Africa's black majority aren't known as adventurous eaters. This is partly because many come from disadvantaged communities and have not had the opportunity to experience other cultures through travel. South Africans' eating habits are also shaped by perceptions. 
during apartheid, segregationist rhetoric and policies were used to demonize Africa and to isolate black South Africans from the rest of the continent. And these negative ideas persist. But this is starting to change as more South Africans mix with African immigrants and travel to other countries on the continent. Chukudozi Obidugu brings in raw ingredients from all over Africa. He says for many of his customers, social media has also contributed to their growing appetite. They said that they get it from YouTube. Then they can ask me if I can give them more emphasis how they will make it. Some of them will come back to me and show me what they make and how it looks like. Then I'll tell them that they do it well. This Tembi Somgati is a South African who was first introduced to food from Nigeria by a neighbor more than a decade ago. He now shops here often for ingredients for a variety of African cuisines. My go-to is beans, because my wife loves those beans. <laughs> my wife loves those beans. They make, yeah, like, yeah, they heavenly. That's it. That's all I can say. The beans are heavenly. <laughs> Over the years, he's found creative ways to get friends and family to overcome their preconceptions. But you know what I usually do? When I invite people over and host, come and buy here in a bowl. Then when I get home, put it in the pots. And then they taste it. And then afterwards, I tell them this is from Zambia, this is from Nigeria, this is from wherever. And they love it. Like, oh, and then they even finish the food. In recent years, African migrants in South Africa have faced discrimination and outbreaks of xenophobic violence. Ngadi wants people to know that South Africa is still also a haven where other Africans who enrich the country with their culture can thrive. And the increasing interest in flavors from around the continent suggests that tastes and attitudes are becoming more diverse. Ntepeng Mutema, Africa Matters, Johannesburg. You're watching Africa Matters, and here is a roundup of other stories making news across the continent. East African leaders will deploy a regional force to try to end fighting in the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The move was announced by the Kenyan president after the seven-member East African community held talks in Nairobi calling for a ceasefire in the volatile region where violence has ensnared neighboring countries. The vast mineral-rich DRC is struggling to suppress dozens of armed groups in its east. A recent flare-up has revived decades-old animosities between Kinshasa and Kigali, with the DRC blaming neighboring Rwanda for a resurgence of the M23 militia. Nigeria's army says it's found two girls abducted by Boko Haram terrorists eight years ago from the town of Chibok. They were kidnapped along with nearly 300 others from their boarding school. One of the girls was found after troops broke up a Boko Haram camp. The other was discovered near the border with Cameroon. Rwanda hosted the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting Chogum which brings together leaders and representatives from the group's 54 members, most of which are former British colonies. It's the first time the meeting has been held in four years after the 2020 Chogum was cancelled because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Enhancing the role of women in leadership, boosting business among Commonwealth countries and supporting youth in leadership roles were among the key issues discussed at the six-day summit. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization says Africa has about 43 billion trees and 26% of its land is classified as forest. But its deforestation rate is nearly twice the global average, with almost 4 million hectares of African forest destroyed each year. Conservation groups estimate that Nigeria has only 4% of forest cover left, making it increasingly difficult for loggers, as Reagan Devine explains. Egbong Tuluwa Mariji says it's becoming increasingly difficult to find trees to cut down. He has to head deeper and deeper into the forest in Nigeria's southwestern Ondo state. But the valuable timber he's searching for is disappearing at an alarming rate. The logging business used to be different. We could cut down over 15 trees in one location. But now if we manage to find two trees, it's a blessing to us. 
In 2019, President Muhammadu Buhari announced a massive tree planting campaign, pledging to plant 25 million trees a year. But the Director General of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation says that's nowhere near enough. We have to plant 300 million trees per year in order to stand still. And we have been cutting this number of trees for so many years. So this will give you an idea of the enormity of the tasks that is ahead. Conservationists say illegal logging, cutting down trees for land, and firewood should also be stopped. Once the last tree falls or fails, the last man dies. There's no, there's no gain saying about it. It's not an exaggeration because we all live on plants. We live on the forest. Mariji felled almost 30 trees last year. Now the 61-year-old fears he won't be able to support his family. I eat and I drink from this forest. I fish and I sell. I cut trees from it and sell. I hunt in it. As the forests disappear, so do the livelihoods of those who cut them down. Regan Devine, Africa Matters. After years of bad treatment, Mozambique's forest is now healing. And it's thanks to coffee plantations. Daniel Padwick has the story. From a distance, Mozambique's Mount Gorongosa looks almost bare. The landmark was once covered by a lush rainforest. But years of clear cutting and conflict damaged the soil and left deep holes. Now the vegetation is finally getting a chance to recover thanks to a new arrival, coffee. Coffee does grow very well under shade and uh, the community uh, has destroyed uh, this um, Gorongosa uh, mountain. So we, we have got an objective to reforestate. So with the coffee, we are very successful uh, in the, uh, bringing back the Gorongosa forest. Julias Sabao started the project after discovering the coffee culture in neighbouring Zimbabwe. He fled there to escape Mozambique's civil war. During the conflict, Mount Gorongosa's environment was used and abused by rebel fighters. Before, all this area was bare. No trees, no nothing was here. But now, if you look, you can see big trees coming, coming back. So there is a very big difference, which means uh, we are successful in our uh, project. While coffee is the main focus of the program, the plant takes years to mature and bear fruit. So in order to ensure growers can continue to make a living, they plant other crops. We have production of uh, bananas and we have a production of beans while the coffee is uh, attaining the first uh, year of production, which usually takes three years. The World Bank says the farming in Gorongosa has created 300 new jobs and benefited around 200,000 people in the community. It's part of a wider effort to rejuvenate the area and could be a model for other parts of the region. So what we do with the communities all around the mountain of uh, Serra Gorongosa is that uh, we interest them in reforestation through additional income, uh, creating additional income through coffee, Sabao exports the coffee around the world, but reinvests the profits back into the local plantations and people. By reviving the forest, he hopes to also plant the seeds for greater production, self-sufficiency and peace. Daniel Padwick, Africa Matters. This week, we explore Masabid in northern Kenya. The area surrounding the city is a giant volcano, the surface of which is peppered with crater lakes. Let's take a look.
That's our show this week. Please share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Adeshawa Josh. You can also watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment and share. Thanks for watching. See you next week.